in five, four, three. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Let Me Introduce You, where I, John Vorhaus, and he, Arne van Oosterum, exchange information about the most fascinating people we know. And for our first guest, I chose the most fascinating person I personally know, the one and only poker guru, decision-making expert, and all-around fabulous person, Annie Duke. Before we bring Annie in, I just want to mention that throughout my life, I've mostly had the experience of walking into a room and knowing for sure that I'm the smartest person in the room. This isn't egoism. This is just a fact. And I felt that way in almost every room I walked into until I walked into a room with Annie Duke. And I saw, without fear of contradiction, this was a woman whose brain dwarfed mine, and I have been in awe of it since the first time I crossed paths with it. Gosh, Annie, how long ago was it? Ladies and gentlemen, Arnie, please let me introduce you to Annie Duke. Annie, welcome yourself on board. Hi, I, I think that the answer is 1995. Holy smoke. I know. Oh, man. It's just to give you an answer. So when, you, uh, when you're asked to um, give your bio in a nutshell, Annie, how do you go about defining yourself? Uh, it's, you know, it's hard because my, my life has taken a lot of very strange twists and turns. But I currently would describe myself as an author um, and a decision strategist and speaker. So I guess that begs the question of what, what's a decision strategist? <laughs> Actually, there's only but, uh, one thing on my mind is like, what's the poker thing? What's, where did that come from? So, oh. so we'll get to that later. We'll, we'll so. get to that. That's, yeah. that's like, basically the way you get to be like... Uh, uh, sort of the way that you sort of craft my career, like where my career is now needs all the weird threads that sort of led up to it. None of which were particularly well planned actually. Uh, so I just happened to have a very weird collision of, um, of expertise, but uh, yeah. So, so I write, I write on uh, decision-making and particularly um, uh, what I do in my, consulting work and my speaking and my writing is I talk about how to make decisions uh, in uncertainty, particularly useful in this moment. Okay. Uh, but I'm trying to use this time uh, where there's coronavirus to let people know that this is actually the same environment that you're making any decision in, really, because there's just there's a lot of uncertainty no matter what, just even in terms of what route you choose to go to work. So are you are you um, saying that there is a certain amount of uncertainty baked into every situation, but our perception of uncertainty differs depending on how intensely we feel, not even perceive, but just feel emotionally, the the uncertainty of the space around us? Yeah. So the, the way that I kind of think about it is, um, you know, we, we all think about The Wizard of Oz like the movie where uh, Dorothy and her pals um, come to the Emerald City, and it's this beautiful, gleaming green city where everything is, you know, this beautiful jewel colored. But if you read the original Frank L. Baum book, that city was actually beige. What happened was that in order to be able to come into the city, you had to put these green glasses on, and they actually locked in place. You couldn't get them off. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually think about that as a really good metaphor for kind of how we view the world, we've got these green glasses on and let's call them our certainty glasses. And mm -hmm. instead of someone forcing to put the, us to put them on, we want them on, we wanna lock them in place. So mm -hmm. we would only take those off and see the uncertainty that exists around us kind of if we were forced to. Um, uh, and there's kind of two ways that you can get forced uh, to. One would be a little bit more mundane. I'll give you the, what's happening now though is not which is when the uncertainty is just so in your face, which is what's happening with coronavirus, COVID, um, you just kind of can't hide from it. So what we knew last week about COVID is different than what we know this week and so on and so forth. So we know that there's a lot of information that we don't know. We know that there's a lot of stuff we don't even know that we don't know. Um, so that piece of uncertainty that, that we're making decisions with imperfect information is impossible to hide from right now. And we also know that there's just a lot of ways that the future could unfold. And it's very hard for us to know with any certainty 
what the fall might look like, for example. Is there going to be a second wave? Is there not? Is when you get to the summer, is the heat going to really help us or won't it? Or, you know, who knows, right? What strategy is it going to work? What isn't? Is South Korea going to continue to be able to control it in the way they are? Is Sweden's strategy in the end going to turn out to work out? Like, who knows? I mean, we can all throw our hands up and say, hard to say. So it's it's just really obvious right now that that's the case. So people are talking about this. And what's really interesting is that I, I've seen a lot of people say, so that means that we can't make any decisions right now, hmm. which of course is a decision in itself, because you're always making decisions, even if your choice is just to sort of lay back and allow the world to happen. But even for like the most mundane decision, it actually looks much more like all that stuff that I described then people are willing to admit because people want to feel like they have control over their destiny. They want to feel like they could predict for sure what the future looks like. And what you're hearing a lot from people is, well, it's a weird decision-making environment, but when it goes back to normal and when things are really stable and I can predict, you know, what the future is going to look like, then, you know, then, then, then I'll start making decisions again. And my simple answer to that is if you own stocks and bonds at the same time, then you're already admitting that you actually don't know what next month is going to look like. (laughs) Because otherwise you wouldn't own those two things at the exact same time. If you've ever gotten to an airport really early or really late, you also know that you actually can't predict the future really well. Because we, we don't have an exact idea of how anything will unfold, but we fool ourselves into thinking we will. And just right now, we, it's just harder to do so. What do you mean by this business of getting to the airport early or late? Well, if you could predict the future perfectly. Oh, I see. You, you would time your arrival perfectly. For, for exactly an hour. But instead, there's all sorts of things that can happen. And you have a choice, right? You can either leave at your normal time and kind of cross your fingers that there's no accident on the road. Mm-hmm. I see. Um, and then if there, isn't an, if there is an accident on the road, you'll be late. Right. So you're you're sort of leaving uh, late as a more likely option or you can leave really early if you feel like you cannot risk missing your flight. Mm -hmm. And now if there's no accident, all of a sudden you're twiddling your thumbs in the airport for two hours. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, You and I are familiar with the concept of risk of ruin from the work we did together in our fabulous book, Decide to Play Great Poker. Which, by the way, has amazing reviews on Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and um, and I've been mindful of risk of ruin and thinking about it a lot in the last few weeks. Uh, this uh, recording is going up on May 22nd. It's being recorded on May 22nd at a time when in the United States, the states are slowly starting to reopen. And we've seen in the last couple of weeks people wanting to leapfrog that and open up real fast. And I keep saying, hang on, you have to consider your risk of ruin like you could die. And that's an unacceptable risk of ruin. So how do you how would you help people navigate their re-engaging with society or re-engaging with others at this point, being mindful of risk of ruin? So, okay, so first of all, let me let me just kind of explain uh, on the risk of ruin side. So there's when when you're making any decision, what you're really thinking about is what's the upside potential and the downside potential. So any decision you make can kind of result in some good things happening where you advance towards your goal. So, so you could think about this simply like in poker, if you if you the amount of money that you can win would be the upside potential on a pot. And the downside uh, potential are kind of the the bad set of outcomes where you retreat away from your goal. So uh, in poker, that would just be you have a potential to lose money as well. So anytime that you enter a pot, um, you can think about what's sort of the amount of money that I could win, what's the amount of money that I could lose, um, and you're balancing that uh, against sort of what available resources that you have that you're that you're entering in. But at the extremes of that is is the risk of ruin, which is I could lose all my money and then I wouldn't actually have anything to invest. And we want to be really sensitive about risk of ruin because um, then you can't, basically you can't get back in the game. So um, if we think about it, like in a poker sense, um, I have some sort of edge, which like my expected value. So let's say I sit down at a table and for every hour that I play, I'm expecting, uh, my expectancy is a hundred dollars, and the way that I make that money is I keep getting to churn money through the game 
hour after hour after hour. And then kind of at the end of many, many hours, like 1500 hours, I should have realized this like hundred dollar an hour gain. The problem is that that requires that I have money to do it. So what I don't want to do is ever risk so much money in one game that the luck can go against me and I could lose all my money and then not be able to bet again in the future where now all of a sudden I can't realize the amount of money that I would have, that I could have made if I still had that money. So that would be like from a monetary standpoint, but as you just pointed out, there's the other types of risk of ruin, like you can die. And obviously if you can die, you can't play the game anymore. Hmm. So one of the things that we're trying to do in our decision-making is always be sort of protecting ourselves against risk of ruin. And when there's a real chance of risk of ruin, we need to be conservative. So interestingly enough, in poker, people are never, well, not never, but almost almost never conservative enough around how much money they want to invest in an individual game because they always overestimate their edge and underestimate the chances that they could actually go broke. This has, this is for reasons we can get into later that have to do with sort of who am I? What are my identities, my identity? What's my belief about my competency? What are my beliefs about how much control I have over, over the way that the world might happen? Do I really understand what 2% means? That's like a big one, but we, we can go into that afterwards, but we tend to uh, underestimate that, uh, overestimate a lot of stuff. So uh, you might, there might be a game where if you really were to work out your risk of ruin and your, and your tolerance for that risk of ruin, it would make sense if you had a thousand dollars to say only invest fifty dollars in any game that you're playing, which seems like a very small amount compared to the total amount you have. But it's to protect against this risk of ruin problem. And what you'll find from players is they'll be investing like two hundred dollars in a game, and then all of a sudden, very quickly, they can go broke. And this is actually one of the main reasons that poker players go broke is not so much because they're not so good at the game but because they're not managing the, this risk of ruin problem and they're kind of overestimating the chances that they're going to win. They're underestimating the likelihood that they're going to lose all their money in one session. Just a whole bunch of stuff goes wrong. So we can think about that framework in terms of what's happening with COVID is that we're really not good at this kind of probabilistic thinking and we're not good at, at, at um, managing risk of ruin. And we tend to underestimate the chances it's going to happen. And we sort of think like, okay, I can kind of theoretically think about that happening to somebody else, but not me. Mm -hmm. what, so, uh, what's, what? Sorry, what? I'm fascinated by this notion that when risk of ruin is high, decision making should trend more toward the conservative side. Is that correct? Yes. What's What's interesting about that is that most of the people who are arguing hardest for quick reopening of the economy would likely, at least in this country, would likely identify themselves as capital C conservatives. But in fact, the course of action is not conservative. It's anti-conservative or radical. Yeah. So, so there, I think that there are actually some good arguments on the sort of neut neutral to politics that you can talk about, about whether you should stay shut down or whether you should open up and how quickly. And, th but those things have to do a little bit with uh, what's the effect of social distancing ver versus the lockdown that an American is willing to comply with. Um, obviously we know that if you could test and trace and track and quarantine, that that would actually change the calculus around lockdown a lot. So that's not necessarily, I think, I think that, that you can be politically neutral and kind of argue the benefits. There's, there's also some things about how long do you want to allow the, the virus to be able to mutate. There's a whole bunch of things like that. But in terms of what you're talking about, um, there's a very, very interesting thing about our identities as it relates to our beliefs. So we have this idea about us that the way that we operate as human beings is that there's information out in the world, we collide with that information, and we process that information rationally, and then we think about it, we vet it, we you know put it into the context of other things that we know and, and what the quality of the source of the information is and all the things that you would expect a rational person to do, and then we use that in order to form our beliefs. And then our beliefs then would, would drive our behavior. So we think about our beliefs as being formed in this very like orderly and rational way. 
But that is not at all what happens. Um, instead, a lot of what's happening is you can think about um, your beliefs are like they form the they're the threads that form the fabric of your identity. So our identity, really, what are what who are we? Like, what is our identity except the things that we believe? Hmm. There's not really much else to it, right? So, so that's the fabric, and we don't like to tear that fabric. We don't want to rip a hole in it. So what happens is that the way that we're interacting with that sort of universe of information that we might be colliding with that stuff that we we don't know um, is actually not sort of this rational objective looking at the information to then update our beliefs. It's that our beliefs are, are really in charge of the way that we're processing the information. So we're fitting the information to our beliefs, number one. And number two, we're, we're tending to behave in a way where we're much more likely to collide with information that agrees with us rather than disagrees with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. that would be confirmation bias. And then the way that we're processing the information is a set of other biases, including something called disconfirmation bias, which is a uh, companion to that. So if I, I, I hear something that disagrees with me, I, I believe that I have, I'll work very hard to discredit it. Now here, here's the interesting thing that there are, that, not all things are created equally around our identity. And one of the prime drivers of how we figure out what we believe in the first place is um, what tribe we belong to. So, you know, tribes aren't just political tribes, right? They're like CrossFit tribes, for example, hmm. or keto tribes, right? Are, are you or a design keto thinking person? tribes? Right, exactly. So, so there's all we we belong to all sorts of different tribes, but obviously political tribes are very strong, and it becomes a very big part of our identity, and it sort of divides us up to, into, into us versus them. And what happens because there's so much uncertainty, because it's very hard to know what we would call ground truth, which is what's objectively true of the world if we were omniscient. That would be ground truth. Um, we live in our, our beliefs are very far from ground truth, right? But we're trying theoretically, we're trying to get to that. Um, but because it's so hard to know what's really true, one of the things that tribe gives us is our epistemology. What, what do we think is true of the world? And our tribe tells us that. So the initial sorting into tribes might be part, partly because, oh, I believe this or I believe that. Um, but then once you're in a tribe, then the tribe is going to tell you what to believe as opposed to the other way around. So if you've been scratching your head out of, you know, at how could it be that that four years ago, uh, Republicans in America just like loved the FBI and thought football was the greatest thing ever. And now all of a sudden they're like, the FBI is the deep state and we need to get rid of them. And um you know, those football players, you know, what, you know, we, we don't like football anymore because of Colin Kaepernick. And that seems very, very strange. And if you've been scratching your head about how Democrats could have been so incredibly suspicious of um, the, the FBI, but now they're the biggest support. They think the FBI is like the greatest thing ever. And they were like a little like football, but now they're really into football and so on and so forth. And you see these flips in beliefs it's because it's a question of what is the leader of your tribe doing? Hmm. So, so, and so we think about our beliefs as like these very permanent things, but tribe sort of trumps all of that, no pun intended. And so as Trump goes, so goes that tribe. Huh. So I wouldn't call what's ha that it, it about being conservative or not in that sense, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. Can I ask uh, a totally different question? Cause I, um, you're talking about tribes. And so you clearly know each other because you jump into the, you know, into the meat of, uh, you know, the, all your knowledge and it's amazing. And, um, but uh, I, I, I actually, I'm also curious about your tribes and, and where you are from and uh, what made you, you and what made your uh, belief system. So can you share, share a little bit for, for people who don't know who you are and because uh, I'm really interested in, um, except, I mean, obviously, the, you, you know what you were saying, but also, where does that come from? Where, where do you start it to become you? Maybe that's the wrong question, but sort of what? So, can you tell me? Let's start where, for instance, where, where are you from? Who are your, um, who, who are your parents? Um, 
So I'm going to answer all this. Let me just say I'm still becoming me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll let you know when I get all right. this. <laughs> um, all right. So I, so my father um, grew up in West Philadelphia, and his parents were both uh, first generation um, from uh, different parts of Eastern Europe. Um, uh, for both of them, Yiddish was their first lang- language. And um, my dad's dad, I think he didn't, he either completed sixth grade or had to leave school in the middle of sixth grade. He, he was orphaned and he started uh, becoming like he was a door to door salesman. That's what, that's how he was surviving as a teenager. Um, and then my, my, uh, dad's mom, you know, did finish high school and whatnot. But, um, so they, they got married. Um, it was the second marriage for both of them. And that marriage produced my father who had four other siblings, two from the mom and two from, two from my grandfather. Um, and I think this is such like a quintessential American story because, uh, you know, here's my father whose father only had a sixth grade education and, and my father has a PhD. So I just, I think that that's so special. And I love that part of my history is that part of, of sort of the, what America can do for you. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and then my mom, um, she, so, so my mom comes from an incredibly waspy family, actually. (laughs) Um, You probably don't know this, this part of the world, but Darien, Connecticut is kind of the quint, it's like the quintessential wasp place. Like if you read any John Cheever novel, it's sort of like set. For those who might not know, wasp is actually an acronym that was popular in our youth, white Anglo-Saxon yeah, Protestant, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it might not be known these days. Yeah, I wonder, can you, yeah, yeah I wonder, I don't, do people still use that word? But um, patrician, let's let's call it that, very patrician. Um, so my, my grandfather was a lawyer. Um, you know, both my grandparents graduated from college, obviously my grandfather from, from law school. Um, and they, they produced my mom. So, uh, my mother and father met at Harvard and, you know, which is more probably of the expectation at that time for where my mom was going to end up. But my father grew up in a very poor part of Philadelphia going to West Philly high, which is like, if, mm-hmm. for people who know that high school, that's, it's amazing. He, he ended up at Harvard. So they, they met over a game of bridge, which I, I really, my dad was playing bridge and they lost their fourth and my mom was walking by to move into her apartment. And he, she said, Hey, do you play bridge? And that, that was that, that produced this family. So, uh, so that was, that's kind of like my origin story in, in terms of my parents. And I, I just love this collision of, you know, this one part, half of the family, which just was very educated from way back. My my uh, great grandfather was also a lawyer, and so on and so forth. And then my dad's part of the family, which is a scrappy, orphaned salesman guy. Is there something no in, your, in you? Do you? Um, is there something within you that sort of that collision of you? Like you, you said, is that do you recognize that in, in who you are? Is that something you took with you? Um, yeah, I, I I recognize it in me. I think for in a few ways. I think one is that I'm I'm. I, I feel like I'm very multilingual, not not in the sense of languages, although I, I can speak another language, one other language, but more in the sense of there's a variety of different environments that you can kind of stick me in, and I can I'm fine in them. So, um, and I think it's because we had this. There was very you know weird sort of cultural collision happening within my own family. You know, when we went and visited my dad's side of the family in Philadelphia. That, you know, it was like the full on, like the plastic on the couch coverings and the tchotchke and the, you know, whole thing. And then we went and, you know, to Darianne and to visit my mom's side of the family. And it was like, that was a whole different situation, right? A quieter for one thing. Um, uh, so I think that I can sort of move in sort of in between those things pretty well. Um, and I kind of like speak those different cultures pretty well. Um, but I think that one of the things I think that one of the things that really sort of was a unifying thing about my my parents and what was kind of going on in our household is that um, so much of it was just about education, you know, that this was the thing. And I think that for my father, it was just so clear to him that education was so incredibly important. Um, 
I think for my mom, it was more assumed, but I think that my dad had really lived this idea that, that education was everything. It was your way up and your, your way out. And if you could get access to that education and really value it. And so I think that I never, I, I don't think I've ever taken my education for granted. I think that I've always had gratitude for it because I kind of understand from my dad's side of the family, kind of a lot more of like what that means and what a privilege it was mm. to have access to the education that, that I, I had, um, you know, and then the, the other thing about that was sort of true culturally about my family was that so much was just sort of discussion and, and that kind of, you know, that, that it wasn't, it wasn't a quiet dinner table. You know, it was a lot of people taking positions and arguing their positions. And my father was the debate coach. Uh, so, so my dad was getting, got a, a master's in English to become a teacher. And he was a, a life he taught his, his, he's still alive, but he taught his whole life. He actually ended up writing a bunch of books and be, becoming a, a sort of speaker teacher. And, but he was, he was a debate coach at the high school that he taught at. And that translated directly into our dinner table. So oh, I think boy, this yeah. idea of allowing the kind of collision of different points of view and really having to be able to convey what you believe and support it and that kind of thing was so, it was such a central part of, of our family. And I think that that definitely, I think that that's definitely translated for me into, into the rest of my life. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these are the things that shape you, right? These are the things that kind of um, uh, kind of make you you. And are there um, are there things that you kind of uh, experience that you said, well, these are you know next to your family, or these are the kind like, of the big key moments in my you know development, whether it's your career or your personality or any things that what we call in storytelling the inflection points of your story. Oh, there's a lot of inflection points for me, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, so uh, I think in, so, there's, there, it's, this is a lot. I mean, first of all, I'm old, so there's just going to be a lot. <laughs> but, um, so I would say, I would say thing number one that was really formative for me was that my mother, for most of the time that I was growing up, was actually very severely alcoholic. Um. And so I think that there was, there's just a lot of things about me and the way I kind of operate in the world that come from having, having grown up in a family with that going on mm -hmm. um, and just sort of, sort of trying to navigate that. And I, I think that what, you know, when, when I think about uncertainty and, and really kind of what do you have control over and what don't you have control over and, and how do you sort of get to this place of kind of just radical acceptance so that you can actually think through how you navigate the problem as opposed to sort of this ownership of it and feeling like things are unfair and, um, you know, that somehow you could control something you can't and, and so on and so forth. Like, I think a lot of that comes from, from that, that it, I think about, I think about the world and, and, and how are you just sort of saying, well, well, this is just true of the world. And so now let me try to make good decisions within the environment that I'm sitting in, as opposed to getting mad at the environment. And I think that that was sort of my coping mechanism. Um, and then it became my, really the thing that I studied for my whole life. Yeah. I think. So mm -hmm. that, I think that would be key thing, number one, to my origin story. I think that if I hadn't grown up, I, I don't know that if I had, if that hadn't been part of my background, I don't know that I would be here. Um, hmm. I'm not sure that I would have landed thinking about the things that I did. I, I might have ended up being like a lawyer or something. I'm not sure. So then, uh, the next inflection point comes from my my father uh, was hired in 1961 by a school called St. Paul's School, which is a boarding school, a very old boarding school in um, the United States. And my father was a diversity hire because uh, he was obviously Jewish. Um, and so I grew up on the, the campus of a school. It was an Episcopalian boarding school. And while my mother, my, my mother was Episcopalian, but she wasn't, you know, she didn't, she wasn't practicing. And the dominant, the more dominant culture in our family was more the, sort of the Jewish culture, um, in terms of the way that we interacted and the way that we talked and the way that we sort of like, you know, what it was happening in terms of our, our house. That, um, uh, and not only that, on top of that, 
uh, he, you know, so he's the only Jew there. We're, we're kind of the only at that time where later on they hired another one, but uh, another Jewish person like in 1977. And then there were, was a handful of Jewish students, but as you can imagine, it was a relatively small handful because it's an Episcopalian school. So, um, so, so we were like really a minority in that sense. Um, so I, I think that, and then the other thing was that um, the people who generally went to that school were like, for, for real, when I went there, there were Rockefellers there hmm. and DuPonts and people from the Pillsbury family and so on and so forth. So this was really a lot of people with, with a lot of wealth were going there. And my father, as I said, had, had kind of got, gotten himself out of this poor neighborhood in Philadelphia. And um, we lived on his salary, which was a teacher's salary. And so not only was it like Episcopalian and, and, you know, we were Jewish, but it was also rich and we were, we were, I mean, we weren't poor, we were middle-class-ish, right? So there was, there were these big contrasts. Um, so I think that I kind of, I think partly that's why I can sort of transition between worlds a little bit better than, than maybe some people can. But the, the other thing is that it definitely, I, I definitely felt like, that I was different than, than the environment that I was sitting in, that, that there were a lot of ways in which I didn't fit very well. Uh, that, and that I kind of, in terms of what I was thinking about, in terms of where I wanted to go to college, because I, I, I had the, a, a piece of luck that happened in my life was a part of my father's salary was you got to go to this school. So there were good and bad things about that, but the good thing about it was it was a ridiculously good education. So I, I got a great high school education. Um, and so as I was thinking about where I wanted to go to college, I wanted to go somewhere that was very not like where I was. Um, and I really um, picked New York as the place that I wanted to go. And I think that that was a big pivot point for me as well to be able to experience college in New York, I think was a really big deal um, for a variety of reasons, just in terms of sort of freeing and sort of getting out of this very small insular right. world into mm -hmm. sort of what is this big world. Uh, but also that's where I met. I, I had a mentor there that really named Barbara Landau, who was really, really incredible. And I, I was a work study student for obvious reasons. I needed financial aid. And um, I just, I ended up, I, I, you know, there was a job posting with this woman, Bar Barbara Landau in the psychology department. I ended up her research assistant for four years and she's amazing. I'm still in touch with her. And she really encouraged me to go to Penn for graduate school. It's where she had trained and she wanted me to study with Lila Gleitman and Henry Gleitman. Um, and I really wanted to stay in New York and she really pushed me hard to, to take the chance and go to Penn, uh, which I did. And that was just, that was a really big deal for me. So that, that definitely was another big inflection point. So then I studied cognitive psychology there. I got a national science foundation fellowship. Um, and then this was, this was the really big pivot point. After five years there, as I'm about to write my dissertation, um, I've been struggling with um, some just physical issues, some physical health issues. Um, I had some pretty bad stomach issues. And I got really sick right as I was about to go out for all of my job talks. So I had to take a year off in order to recuperate. And that's when I started playing poker. Um, so obviously that's the biggest pivot point. And the reason why I started playing poker honestly wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go become a poker player. It was, I'm really sick. I don't want to start a new career because I'm going to go right back to academics. Um, and I, there's no way I can do a nine to five job because I don't know how I'm going to feel from day to day. And so my brother suggested to me, you know, my, bro my brother, who's Howard Letter, who's a world champion poker player in his own right, um, had already been playing for about 10 years by the time this all happened to me. And he suggested to me that poker might be something that I could do kind of to fill in the gaps and, and um, that I could do that in the meantime. Um, and that's, how I, that's how I landed at, you know, playing poker. And I feel like that's the big moment in my life because that's where what I was studying in cognitive psychology, which was about learning mm -hmm. and, and how does an organism learn, particularly human beings, how do, how do human beings learn, now collides with poker, which is just an exercise and learning in this very weird and uncertain environment and boom, those come together. And then that's where I become formed. I feel like. That's awesome. <laughs> and you went through a, a sort of a journeyman phase 
and then poker took off in the early 2000s and you became that was a- so weird it's, it's so weird and there's a lot of things about that that I'm grateful for but I think I would have been happier had that not happened um, had you not become a public figure a celebrity yeah so I think that part of the reason why so I started playing poker and you know the question is why didn't I go back to academics and it's well, first of all, it turned out that I was pretty good at poker. So that was, that kind of kept me there. But the other thing was that I actually physically didn't feel well. And poker is a, at that time was a really nice place to hide. So you, you didn't really, you, you, it was a way to sort of retreat from the world. It was a very strange thing to do. It was kind of on the edge of what was acceptable in society at that time, because it wasn't on television. So it was just kind of weird. And I was pretty comfortable with weird because I had grown up in this environment where I was definitely weird. And so I think that it was a little bit my comfort zone to be sort of like on the edge of like whatever was going on around me. And um, it was very, very anonymous. I was definitely not ever going to become a public figure that way. And I think that that kind of felt good to me. I think that when you're, you know, a lot of people who, who, are physically not feeling well experienced this sort of desire to retreat. And I think poker was a really good place for me to retreat too. Um, so uh, I was pretty comfortable with that. Like I kind of liked that I lived in this kind of little world and, and nobody knew who I was. And then one day they did. So uh, it was, it was eight years after I started playing that all of a sudden they were like, we're going to start filming poker on television. And it was very weird because I think that, when when people do things where you become can be where it's possible for you to become well known, um, they kind of know going into it that that's a possibility. That if you actually succeed at what you do, then there's a lot of people who are going to know who you are that you never met. And that was not the case when I started playing poker. I, if I succeeded at what I did in poker, I was going to get five people were going to know who I was, <laughs> regardless. <laughs> Regard they actually more people might know who I was if I didn't succeed because they might be more eager to play with me. But um, yeah, you succeeded. You were good at playing poker. When did you know that you'd crossed over? When did you know you'd become a public figure? Uh, probably the first time somebody asked for my autograph. Hmm. Really? I thought it was really can weird. Can you still, still remember that moment? Yeah, it was uh, it, the World Series in. That's the World Series of Poker, folks. Yeah, the, sorry, not the World Series of Baseball. <laughs> The World Series of Poker, I was playing an event. No, actually, that's not where it happened. It was before the World Series. There was a there was a tournament that occurred at the bike. Uh, no, at is it at the bike? No, Commerce. it was at the Shooting Stars at, at Bay One Hundred One. Oh, okay. And I got asked to be one of the Shooting Stars, which at that time didn't really mean anything. But it was right on that edge, the precipice, when poker was just starting to get on TV. And I remember somebody was standing on on the rail, which is just meaning they, they weren't in the game. They were an observer. And um, and they asked for my autograph. And I was like, OK, <laughs> I don't know why you would want me to sign something, but whatever. So, uh, yeah. So and then I think that beyond that, like. It was, it was uh, once poker got on TV, unless I decided to switch careers, which at that time I wasn't ready to do, um, it was going to be hard for me to not have notoriety, not actually because I was good, but because I was once again unusual. I mean, this is kind of the theme through my life because poker is mostly men. And when I say mostly, I mean like 97% men. So uh, really mostly men. Really? Um, and, you know, so this idea of this this woman who at the time, I mean, I had four children. Uh, you know, I was double Ivy League educated, you know, playing poker. That that was just bizarre. And so uh, I think that for that reason, outside of any skill that I had, um, it was going to be hard for people not to sort of pay pay attention to the fact that I existed. And then on top of that, I think that as poker was becoming popular, the people who were producing it for television were aware that it had some like unsavory connotations that went along, you know, like people weren't thinking like poker is like a super wholesome activity or anything like that. Right. It, it got, it got put in, it got dumped in with a bunch of vices, like, you know, 
oh, you're a poker player and a drug dealer. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I think they, they were aware that they kind of wanted to soften the edges a little bit of it. Um, and I think that as they were thinking about the people that they wanted to highlight, that they had that in mind. So um, I think I was a good way to soften those edges. You know, I was, I, you know, I was this person who, you know, I had a master's and just about a PhD and I was a mom and I had four little kids and, you know, I, I think it was a way for them to kind of soften the edges of, of poker. And so, um, you know, and the, the benefit of that for me was that I, I actually for real did not have to be as good as, as the other players because I was weird. You mean you didn't have to be as good from a competitive point of view or from a, a um, celebrity point of view? Oh, from a competitive point of view. In other words, like I, I didn't need to be, I didn't need to be like winning as many championships or right. So, so for, for somebody who was like a 22 year old white guy to get noticed in poker, mm. um, they were either going to have to do something very theatrical, right. right? So they they could maybe be really loud or, you know, berate other people or wear funny clothes or they'd have to do something like that. Or they just had to be really good. Like they had to be just winning a lot of championships and a lot of tournaments. Um, so there was, I think, a lot more pressure on somebody who was more the norm for the people who were playing poker to actually have to perform really well. And I'm not saying that I didn't want to perform. I mean, obviously I did, but I, I, I got more than my share of attention compared to what my talent level was and what my accomplishments were by a lot. So by being, you, go ahead, Ernie. Yeah. So if, so I'm, I'm just wondering, it's because you, you have to take a year off because you were ill mm -hmm. that led you to poker. And because you were odd <laughs> as a poker player uh, and, and, and they saw sort of, you know, some, some uh, benefits of having you sort of uh, part of it, you know, soften it up, as, as you said. Do you think um, it's just chance, just luck, or is there something else as well that it happened to you? Yeah, so, so look, every, every single thing that happens in our lives is some mixture of luck and skill. And the fact is that there's a lot more luck involved than any of us would like to believe. Mm. I mean, for one thing at the base of every life is just the luck of like, who are you born to? Right. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I was born to particular parents at a particular time and it really matters when I was born. Cause if I had born, been born in 1600, right. uh, as a woman, you know, I wouldn't have even been able to own property. I think I would have been property actually. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I was I was born at a time when, as I was coming out of college, it was you weren't going to college to get an MRS, as they used to say. Um, you know, you were really going to college to try to form a career, and uh, you know, and that's because all the stuff you know had happened before me in terms of kind of women's lib and women entering the workforce, and I always had that sense, not just not just because of my parents who really expected me to do stuff with my life, but also society was telling me it was okay for me to have hopes and dreams and want to do that. That's that's luck, right? That if I had been born into the 50s and wanted to try to do some of the things that I did, I mean, you know, I think about like, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was like, you know, she, she couldn't get a job out of law school. And I think she was like top of her class or something because it was like, well, you're not you just married and you're going to have children. You know, it's just like, so I think I was very lucky in that way. But in terms of what, what happened with poker, there's, there's two things that are true. One is that um, uh, it was completely luck that led me to poker. My brother had played before me. If that hadn't happened, there's no way I would have even known that it was a thing that you could do. I, that, that would have been very weird. Um, if I hadn't gotten sick, there, I have no doubt that I would be a professor. I would, I would still be a professor. And honestly, I don't know. I mean, I think I would have maybe been good at it. I hope, but um, I don't know. Um, but then the, the other thing I think besides luck is that the decision to go play poker was a horrible decision in the sense that there was kind of no process to it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel good. So I wasn't really thinking about like, what does this mean for my career and how is my life going to play out and all the things that you should really think about when you're abandoning graduate school. Um, 
I, I did it with very little thought to it. So I, I think it was an awful decision. Like what, if I think about like, what are the really terrible decisions in my life? I would say choosing to play poker and leave academics would be prob- might be number one. So, um, and I think this is, this, this is one of the things that I really think pretty deeply about, because I think there's kind of two lessons here. One is that people assume that because it worked out, it must've been a good decision. Mm-hmm. And no, I mean, it worked out, but I think it was a horrible decision process wise and if I had actually thought it through, I don't think that I would have made that decision. Um, but again, I just didn't feel good. So, um, and then the other thing that I think about is that at the time when I was sick, I, I thought that I was having very bad luck. But in retrospect, I look back at that and I realize, oh, I was actually having quite good luck. So I think that one of the things that's important to realize, and I think it makes us more accepting of kind of what's happening in our environment, is that the valence that we put on luck, you know, good or bad, it changes over time. And to put that judgment on this is good luck or bad luck, like in the moment, Mm -hmm. I think um, is unhelpful. I think that it can make you sort of emotionally attached to it. I think it's bad for your decision making. And I think that if you can just say there is luck and not put good or bad on it, because you don't know how that's going to play over time. And I think that that was a really big lesson that I took from that as well. So that, but that's not to say that once I played poker, I didn't execute on it well. Hmm. I was good at the game. I mean, as much as I say, like there were lots of people who were way better than me and that I got more than my fair share of attention and fame compare, you know, in relation to the skill that I had. There must have been I was still a women, very skillful player. There must have been more women playing poker at the time. Uh, never a large number. The, no, no, but I mean, after, no, 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 I'm sure, but there must, there must have been more. No, Let, <laughs> like, let me offer this no. perspective. I'm going to put it in base no, terms. They no. weren't as hot as any I, I Seriously, I, I did not know that. So, uh, oh. There, that, there there's were, another. The most of the women playing poker at that time Honestly, this, I shouldn't surprise you, were like the girlfriend or the wife of somebody who was a poker player. And so then they were oh, like right. bored. And so yeah, okay. the, they would teach them some, there were very few people who were like actually playing like seriously for a living. There was, yeah. you know, Jennifer Herman, Cindy Violet. Uh, there were, you know, a few other people. Those would be two that really come to mind um, at that time, that early uh, it was it was a really small number, and and in absolute terms, it was a much smaller number because one thing that's true has been true about poker is that the percentage of women hasn't changed, but at that time, poker was much less popular, so there were just fewer people. So uh, there, it was the same percentage of women playing, and there were fewer people. So there were there were very few women playing. There's another aspect of this that I'd like to weigh in on. There's a saying: "Fate is what life hands you; free will is what you choose to accept." When Annie was in poker, even before poker was popular, she was leaning into it. She was leading, uh, well, we first met when she launched a poker magazine. And at every turn of the wheel, when there was an opportunity that required somebody to think the opportunity through and advance toward it, she was doing it. So, right. so there may have been other women who didn't go as far with their assets because they weren't as um, exactly. risk defined and willing to uh, lean into the change that was presenting itself. That's my sense. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Part a, Annie was already a champion of poker before poker became popular. And you won't know this, Arnie, but w- when she says that it was kind of unsavory, she's really understating it. Mm-hmm. As, as late as the year 2000, it was a backroom enterprise. It was evil. It was associated with compulsive gambling, broken homes, drinking, carrying on, and, and very macho, very um, uh, misogynistic. So part, yes. of what, part of what Annie had going for her as both a challenge and an edge was every single man she played against played against her as a woman. That is played against her as if as they were playing against a woman, and it was a completely different approach that they had. I'm not wrong, am I, Annie? So no. Well, I wouldn't say every single man because they're, they're one of the hallmarks of some of the great players was they just took you as you come. So came so you know someone like uh, Eric Seidel or John Hennigan or you know variety of, of people. That, that the fact is that they they don't didn't put anybody into a box like that, and that was that's one of the one of the things that made them great. But yes, m- m- most people that would be true of. 
And what's interesting is like when you think about, you know, some of the stuff that we started talking about identity and tribe and that kind of thing. Um, when you think about what's the stickiness of somebody's beliefs, how are they, how are they taking the information that's being presented to them and processing it? One of the things that, that I discovered and I've, I've thought about a lot in my life is that I think partly because I was unusual and because I was a woman and because there was so much misogyny going on that even though uh, I was winning and doing really well, um, my opponents tended not to adjust their view of me that I was like, I mean, I guess a dumb broad would be sort of the way to um, summarize it. And so uh, I started my career playing actually in Montana. That's a whole other story about how I ended up there. But um, I started off playing in Montana and I played there for like three years and I just won. I mean, I just like vacuumed up money out of the game. And I would say that like 75 or 80% of the people I play with would still, they're the main thing that they would tell you about me is that I was very lucky. Hmm. Yeah. So you can think about like, how do you, how do you square, you know, this person who couldn't possibly be good because I'm a woman um, and square that with your idea, like, uh, um, you know, that you're a man and how could a woman possibly be beating you at poker? And that, well, okay, there's this great way to do it. Like, so she's the luckiest person that I ever saw. Um, they didn't say person though. They said something that started with C, but whatever. And, um, croissant. Yes. Croissant. I was the luckiest croissant <laughs> I ever saw. Um, and I, and I got called a croissant to my face. <laughs> no, like literally like almost really? every day. No, for real. And, um, so, I, you know, I think that that actually, like, if you go back to that idea of, you know, what I said was like this really important part of my origin story was the fact that my mother was quite sick with alcoholism. And you say like, how does, how does somebody, you know, I'm a mom, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I, I obviously was in a much more genteel environment when I was, you know, going through my education and I end up at this table where people are calling me a croissant every day. Um, and it's like, how am I doing that? And it had to do with that thing when, you know, I was growing up, I yeah. just had to figure out like, that's you and I don't right. control you and you will not, you will not invade exactly. my life. And I have to think about what, what, how do I make this, this quote unquote relationship that this interaction that we're having work for me and not allow it to get into my emotional space. When did you start um, and realizing And I think that, that was something that I was pretty good at. When did you start realizing the um, that connection? That was it at that time that you thought, oh I can deal with it because this is how I grew up and and or or was that something that you figured out later? So, I think it was something that I figured out later. Like I think it was a lot of um a lot of therapy later. Because I, there's, there's also, there's also a dark side to it. I mean, I think that any quality that you have that has positives to it, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that doesn't have like a shadow side to it. And the shadow side of that was that uh, you will not, you will not chase me away and you will not affect me and you will not, you know, so it might've actually been like healthier for me to say, this is an awful environment and these people are really miserable. And why would I want to be around these miserable exactly. you know, people? Not everybody, again, they're, they're, in any game that I played in, there were lovely people, mm -hmm. but we know that the, the two lovely people don't, aren't going to outweigh the people who are saying all of these horrible things to you. But it was just so like, you're not going to beat me down. And I think that uh, there were a lot of choices that I made in my life where if, if I were to look back, I would have said, you know, the thing is that there, there's a different way to look at that, which is um, if I'm staying in a place where I'm unhappy, that's actually you having control over me. So you can make both sides of the argument, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm going to stay here because you will not control me and you will not make me leave. Mm -hmm. But if, if I'm really, if it's stressful and unhappy and yucky for me and I have other places to go, then by staying sticking and staying and saying, you will not beat me. That's a whole, that's a whole other way for you to control me. And I think that I always had the tendency to say, you will not move. I, you, I am immovable. You mm -hmm. will not make me go away. You will not hurt me. You will not do this. And I don't know that that's necessarily helpful either. I mean, it, it, it happened to have kept me playing poker for a long time, but you know, I think about both sides of that. And so um, just kind of like over time, as I was kind of thinking about like what was happening and why was why was I sitting in these environments where people 
I mean, poker is this very weird thing, right? Where you just don't really get to see people at their best. And the reason is that if you think about anything else that you do where there's like, where you're in a negotiation with someone else, which is really all business, right? It's also all personal relationships, but in business where there's an exchange of money, when you're done, like, Arne, you don't have to hand me your money, Arnie. Like, you don't have to be like, okay, here, now put yeah. it in my hand right in front of my face. And by the way, I'm a woman. And so it's super insulting to you. Like, do that. And the other thing that's interesting about poker is not just that it's so personal that these the, the exchange of money is happening, like, right there. But also that it's a weird thing about poker that it's not fun if you're not playing for an amount of money that can hurt you. Oh, yeah. So if, if you just went and played like, you know, on a free poker site for, for where you weren't keeping any score and, and by the way, just because money's the wrong thing, it's like, if you're not playing for chips that matter to you. Mm. So I could go play on a free site. And if I really cared about how many chips I was accumulating, I, I that could be fun. But if you're not playing for something that really matters to you, it's actually right. not, it's not that fun a game. So by definition, if people were losing money, they were losing um, an amount of money that was painful for them. And under those circumstances, naturally, people are not necessarily at their best. Like everybody has some sort of range in terms of the quality of person that you're presenting that day. Like the underneath quality sort of remains the same, but you might be presenting like the best version of you or the worst version of you. And we, you know, we all know this, like we, everybody has bad days. There's stuff going on in your life that can cause you to act out or just be short. You're to a driver on the road or something like that. Right. It, it's just like, you know, there's like an A plus version of everybody and like an F version of everybody. And the problem in poker is that you just end up interacting with sort of the worst version or the <laughs> worst versions of people. And I always think about like that. There's so many people where I was just like, I did, did, did just felt like the worst person on earth. And I wonder if I had met them in a different environment, right. yeah, they, I might've thought they were great, you know? Yeah. And that's the one thing that I really look back on is that one of the things that went along with poker was that I really was not seeing people at their best. And ultimately that was actually a really big reason why I left because at the same time I was playing poker, I started in 2002, I started doing this consulting. And that's another point of like, ridiculous luck in my life, which is um, in 2002, my friend Eric Seidel, one of the greatest players ever, possibly the greatest player ever, um, got asked by a friend of his to come speak to a group of options traders. And Eric just doesn't like talking in front of groups. And so he knew that I had, when I was in college, I was, I taught classes, I taught undergraduate classes. And so he figured I might be pretty well suited to that. And so he just recommended me to his friend, Roger Lowe, and um, I went and did that. And I, I talked about uh, really risk attitudes as they, as they relate to kind of emotional control. That was sort of what I talked about there. And it's, I've, I continue to talk about that topic a lot. And that kind of launched this career of speaking because he ended up recommending me to some other people. And I ended up, that was the moment where really my academic and poker life really collided because I started to bring that into how do you understand human learning and, and emotional control and cognitive bias and all of this stuff as it relates to the really real world high pressure decision making. And what I noticed was that when I was doing those talks and, you know, it was a lot of things, you know, finance and executives. So again, you know, mostly white males that I'm speaking to, they all seemed quite lovely. And that, you know, and sort of over time, I started to think about, well, aren't, are, maybe these are sort of the same people yeah. And in one environment, I'm seeing them in this situation that's very win-win. And so I'm seeing the lovely, like, A-plus version of them. And in the other environment, I'm seeing, some, I'm in, seeing something that's more zero-sum. And so I'm seeing a, a worse version of, like, this sort of the worst version of, of that type of person. Um, and I started thinking about how those interacted and, and being a little bit more intentional and in, in kind of the choice of where did I want to end up being like how how did I want to be interacting with people? Yeah. That's Tell really, us about uh, celebrity apprentice. Image. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What did you say, John? <laughs> I'm just. I, I couldn't let this this interview go by without asking <laughs> Annie to share her experience of being on Celebrity Apprentice. 
Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a weird segue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the master of the weird segue. Yeah, no, that was what would you like to know? What would you like to know about Celebrity well, Apprentice? Well, we all remember that Celebrity Apprentice was uh, hosted by someone who's gone on to other uh, aspects of public life. Yes. And uh, okay. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not asking you to dish, but if you want to dish, feel free to dish. You know, um, I, just, I just watched The Last Dance. And so it just, De Dennis Rodman was on my season of Celebrity Apprentice. Um, let me see if I can put the question a different way. In terms of pure celebrity for the sake of celebrity, that was kind of, um, from there you could have gone on to be a Kardashian, one might say. D did you look at that environment and say, no, nope, that's not the place for me? Or did you, would you have gone further down that road if it had presented itself to you? So, so that that's actually a I don't I'm not, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that about that which is really nice thank you um, I appreciate the unusual question so uh, so from the time that poker sort of became popular so this was really long before Celebrity Apprentice um, I got approached by a lot of producers sort of wanting to do like a you know sort of like an Osborne's like reality show because I think they they thought it was kind of you know super interesting that it was like mom with four kids who plays poker and mm. wouldn't it be interesting to follow her around with a camera um I I don't think it would have been because I think my life was actually pretty boring but whatever they they I got approached by a lot of people and one of the things that I really try to be mindful of is uh who who is it who can you make choices for who are you allowed to make these kinds of choices for? And kind of thinking about risk of ruin and, and risk aversion that, that sort of back to that beginning conversation that that when when there's there is very clear and and drastic downside to something, you should really stay on the conservative side of the choice. I, I really felt like that. So that applied to the decision making decisions for my children as far as a reality show would go. Right. Did, did I want my children to, to grow up with cameras around them? And I felt like that the risk of the, the risk was too great. Like, I just didn't want the exposure to the downside of like, you know, kids who were somehow famous at age eight and what that might do to them. And mm. that I didn't I really didn't feel like I had a writer that it would be fair of me to choose some sort of weird, famous fame for them that I, I could choose that for myself because I could have left poker or not left poker or whatever, but that I, I really shouldn't be making that choice for my, for my kids. And so every time one of these people came around, I would, I would say, Oh yeah, no, we can totally talk about it. But just so you know, I don't want my children on camera. Hmm. And they would say, Oh, I admire that so much. Of course we're still interested. And then they would go away and I'd never hear from them again. So, hmm. uh, which was the intended, the intended outcome. That was the intended outcome. So, so that had been happening long before Celebrity Apprentice ever came around. And then when I got asked to do Celebrity Apprentice, I, I told my manager that I was a very, very firm no. And um, that I didn't have any interest in just sort of being on a reality show that, that obviously when I was being filmed doing my job, that, that that was just sort of part of what my job was, but that I didn't, I didn't want to be sort of famous for fame's sake. And he, he said, well, please just come and meet with the producers. And just so you know, like I had never watched The Apprentice. I hadn't watched the, I was on the second season of Celebrity Apprentice, but I certainly hadn't watched the first season of it. Um, but they, they really, you know, he was like, please just come meet with them. So I was like, fine, whatever. I'll, if you'll just shut up, I'll go meet with the producers. Mm -hmm. And it was at that meeting that I discovered that there was a charity component to it. So I, I hadn't known that. So um, in the regular apprentice, you're playing for, an, you know, some amount of money for you and like a job in the Trump organization or whatever. Um, but in the celebrity version, you're, you're playing for a charity. And the whole thing is raising money for nonprofits. Uh, so I kind of thought about that. And I said, you know, it, it kind of fit the bill, right? Like my kids aren't going to be on television. Um, and I said, I just sort of felt like this would be a good platform to raise money for some, some things that I cared about. And uh, so that was actually why, that was why I agreed to do it. Um, and then afterwards I got asked, I got asked about dancing with the stars. And I said, no, after my experience on Celebrity Apprentice, I was like, I'll just write a check to charity. Thank you very much. <laughs> like 
Was I don't it a have bad experience? Anything. Why was it such a bad? Um, well, let, let me just put it this way: they then did an all star star version of it, and they they asked me four different times to be on the Celebrity Apprentice All Stars version, and um, I. I kept saying no. And they said, well, would you meet with, you know, this other person? And I'm like, I can meet with them, but I'm still going to say no. And then I'm still going to say no. I'm still going to say no. I really didn't want to do that again. It's, I, I found, I found it to be unpleasant. And I think the reason why is a lot of the reasons that I'd already been sort of thinking about in relation to poker, which is what makes reality TV, reality TV is conflict. Mm, right. And I didn't, I just don't like, I don't find that fun, you know? And, and I remember actually asking the producers after I sort of had said, Oh, they're, you know, because they said like the first season had raised like a million dollars for charity. It's just kind of like, I felt like that was just kind of hard to say no to. And I remember saying, well, I haven't actually watched the show. So I just want to understand for Donald Trump, does he, like what's happening when there's conflict? Like, does he not like the person who's causing the conflict? Is he happy if someone's throwing somebody else under the bus or is he unhappy about that? Like, I just want to understand some things about the way he operates. And it was just, no, more, the more conflict, the better throw everybody under the bus, you know? And um, so, and you know, and that was fine. Cause like, I know how to, I know how to navigate a game like that, obviously. Mm, yeah. And I think that I navigated in a way where I actually didn't throw anybody under the bus. I don't think. I mean, I don't know, John. You watched it. You can tell me. Maybe I'm deluding myself. Um, <laughs> like we're I gonna can remember. That. It. We're going to rewatch it right after this interview. <laughs> I don't. I think. I think one of the things that I really set out to do was like anything that I said in like one of those off camera, like you know, private interviews. Confessionals, I, they're called. Yeah, the confessionals were things that I would have said also, like that that those comported. I wasn't saying anything different in those in, in, than the, what I was saying out loud or the way that I was behaving on the show. But um, I tried not to. I mean, maybe I did, but I, I tried not to. And um, I sort of tried to stay a, away from the conflict, but uh, there was a lot of sort of conflict coming at me. And um, anyway, I just, it, it wasn't fun. Like I, it just, mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't, I did not enjoy the experience. And I said, okay, well, that's it. Now I know that. Now I know, now I know that's not something I like doing. So I, I chose not to continue to do it ever again. And then the next big choice you made was to kind of leave poker behind. Well, that decision was made for a lot of us when online poker was made illegal in the United States. And that kind of changed the, the market and the industry. But uh, can you tell us about how you transitioned from where you were to where you are? Yeah, there was there was a lot of stuff that went into that decision for me to leave. I I had already started to sort of absent myself from daily play anyway because I wasn't for for the reasons that we've been discussing. But then at the time that I chose to leave, obviously, like you know, online poker blew up, and um, but you know, the DOJ shut it down, and then my my brother was caught up in that in in a way that was uh, unpleasant for him, and I think not not great in terms of sort of the way that the community was perceiving him. And I think some of that was coming on to me. Um, and obviously I really love my brother and, and um, seeing the pain and whatever that he was going through was not really pleasant. And then I had a company called Epic Poker and um, that I had founded with some other people. And that obviously uh, didn't do well once, once that economy collapsed. And when that went, when, uh, when that company failed, which, you know, in that kind of environment, it will. Um, I think that people started sort of melding the two things together, like what was happening with my brother and what was happening with that. And it just became, it just, it just was a, it was a hard, really hard time. There was a lot of anger in the poker community period. And then there was a certain amount of anger that was being sort of directed my way, directed to my brother, you know, I'm sure some deserved, some undeserved, whatever. And, um, and I already had this other career going on and I just kind of realized like, I, again, it, it, that was actually the moment where I said, there's two different ways that you can, that you can think about, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to make me do what you want me to do. Um, and, you know, in the early days of my career, it was, you know, I'm, I, you're not going to chase me away from this table. and at that point later on, I was like, you know what? I want to, I actually want to 
be interacting with the A plus version of people. And if I stay for the sake of staying, that's actually the way to, you know, then, then that's the win because I'm not going to be happy and I would like to go find happiness. So, um, I left, um, and what, what that allowed me to do was I, around, right around the time that Celebrity Apprentice was happening, I kind of had it in my head that I wanted to write two books. Um, and the first book that I wanted to write was a poker book that was really informed by decision science, by, by how you might think through decisions. And that's a book that I wrote with someone named John Vorhaus. I don't know if you know who he is. <laughs> and it's called Decide to Play Great Poker. And that came out in 2012. Interestingly enough, actually right around when all of this stuff ha- was happening, like the whole econ- the poker economy was cratering, the stuff was happening with Full Tilt Poker, which was my brother's company. And then obviously Epic Poker at that time was, was struggling, which was the company that I had been involved with. And um, that book came out. And then, uh, but I always had, I always wanted to write kind of its mirror image of that book. So, so that was like poker is informed by decision science, but then I really wanted to write the decision science is informed by sort of thinking about what poker can tell you about how you can, how you can become a better decision maker. And uh, like I had that on my list for a really long time and I just was kind of not getting to it. And so after I left, um, I really started to focus on, on actually writing that book because I, I really didn't want to write that book. And um, it took me a little while. It can't, it can't, I think I, I finally got around to like, okay, I'm really going to work on the proposal and really do this in 2015. And then, um, you know, in 2018, it came out and that was Thinking in Bats. And uh, that was like, that was a really nice thing for me. It was, it's a national bestseller. And it's the way that uh, people have responded to it. Like, I mean, I'm incredibly grateful for it because I do feel like it's so much sort of the, the culmination of like all these different paths that I ended up on some good, not so good, some good decisions, some bad decisions, a lot of luck, who knows if it was good or bad or whatever. And I kind of dumped it all into this, this book thinking in bets and, um, it really has, that book has opened up like more relationships to me. You know, I, I know really cool people through that. People have really responded to kind of the framework and the mental models that like I'm offering in that book. And now I've got another book coming out in September called How to Decide, uh, which is like a really practical book for like, how would you actually map decisions out and, and what would a good decision process look like? And I'm really excited about that. And that really you know, th- my capacity for, for thinking about that really came out of really just saying like uh, exiting poker and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to go find, I, and I think it's really, I mean, I really do believe like, it, I think, I think it's the same people. It's just that I'm seeing them in an environment that allows those people to shine. Hmm. And it's just, it's, it's like I, my life is so joyful now. And I get to think about the same problems that I was thinking about when I was playing poker, because it's all the same stuff, like trying to tackle this and figure it out and understand how to, how to make decisions under uncertainty. There, there's no difference. It's just that I get to do it in an environment where people are really shining. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm seeing the, the A-plus version of them, and I'm applying it to, to problems that can really make a difference, like I think. And then, and then along with that, in 2014, I co-founded a nonprofit called um, the Decision Education Foundation, really trying to take these concepts. This was as I was starting to think about really getting down to writing this other book, how to take these concepts about like, how do you, how do you make good decisions and bring it into K through 12 education? And so I got to start sort of living that as well. Um, and I moved back east, which is really where my brain belongs. And, hmm. um, and I, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and, and I think that that's another, I think that's another example in my life of like, it, you really want to avoid saying good or bad luck because at the time when, you know, the poker economy created, cratered and there was sort of all this anger and I had this company that was failing and my brother was going through all of this um, heart heartache and, 
his, you know, what was going on with his business. And, you know, there was some other stuff involved with that that was really, really difficult for him. I really felt like in terms of that, that there was just, there was a lot, you know, partly because of the world that I had chosen to be in, but there was also just some, some really bad luck happening. But, but, you know, I look back on that and I'm like, that's what really pushed me in the end to make the decision to go mm-hmm. and, and do this other stuff and really start pursuing the decision strategy stuff, the nonprofit work that I do, the, the consulting that I do and the writing that I do now. And, um, boy, I'm, it's, you know, i I'm so grateful for what I get to do every single day now. Yeah, it seems to me that the bad luck, I mean, you know, the, the poker came when you were ill, right? Yeah. So, and it's, and then the, the other bad luck stopped it sort of, but it kind of created this other opportunity for you. It pushed you at least. Um, yeah. So it's actually, so what, you, what do you do in such a situation? What do you yeah. do with it? So, and I think that's real. If you, so do you, do you consider yourself a leader? Are you a leader? And, and, uh, and if, if so, what, what does that mean to you? Ask your kids. <laughs> you know, because of, be, because of my job, my job is really kind of slot slots into more thought partner. Right. Um, and I think that one of the things that I really coach leaders about is to really think about the people on their team and the people in their company as thought partners. Right. Um, even if they're the sole decision maker, right. Even if the leader is the sole decision maker, the more that they can allow the different perspectives of their team to shine and inform their thinking, right. the better off they are. So the I really- always, yeah. Is the leader always the decision maker? Not always, no, but I'm saying even if they were. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, even if they were, you want you want the people around you who are informing that decision to shine as much as possible and to, to be able to bring their own perspective and their own beliefs and really be partners in the process. Um, and that's just kind of the framework through which I, look at the world. So I'm definitely, I'm not a follower. I'm, I know that, but uh, I, I think that, le- you know, I think in some ways like leader is not a great word to use because I think it, Im- it sort of imposes this hierarchy mm-hmm. and sort of, this, you know, you're this, are you important? Are you not important? Whatever. Right. Um, in terms of a framework for how you're thinking about interactions. And I think that the more that you can think about other people as, as partners in in your decision process, you know the the better off you are. I, I think it increases the amount that you're you allow yourself to collide with with dispersion of opinion, which is really good for you. Um, and I think that when you start to impose these hierarchies in these very sort of structured ways of looking at the world, that you're it it actually exacerbates those biases that kind of make us hide from that. Um, so I, yeah, so it's a, it's kind of a weird question. So I, I mean, I can answer in the negative. I would hardly call myself a follower. Right. Well, I think um, mm-hmm. leadership is often conflated with being the boss. Yeah. And if you broaden your definition to include such things, not just as management of personnel, but also facilitating the right. actions of others and especially contributing thought leadership, everything on the creative spectrum of, mm-hmm. hey, if you think about it this way, you might get a different outcome. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would yeah. I would say you're very much a thought leader in the sense that you're someone who has the intentionality and the capacity to create impact on others, which is yeah. But it's interesting to me that you that the word the word leader kind of see it because I you know, I see you kind of struggle with it because it means something to to most people that yeah. fit with your which goes back to your basic point about um anna you said based on your belief orientation and which beliefs you have and which beliefs yeah. you're defending yeah. your very different definition of leadership not only will it not match somebody else's definition of leadership but you will very very forcefully defend your definition of leadership just because it's your definition of leadership yeah i, th- I think that i think that that's I think that that's definitely true. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I do think that a lot of the, a, a lot of the problems that come out of group decision-making are because 
there's a very clearly defined leader in the in the sense that Ernie was saying leader um, in the room. And I think that can cause all sorts of havoc, mm. right? It, it depends on how you define leadership, right? Like, cause obviously I, the good version of leadership is allowing everybody to shine and be their most amazing self. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I call wins all around. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, one of the through lines for, as I think about kind of my life and my career, in terms of how I interact with people is that I, I've just become much more focused more and more and more on just, uh, just wanting to allow, help the people around me be kind of their most shiny version of themselves. Yeah. And I can definitely say that when I first went for a lot of when I was playing poker, that wasn't true. I mean, part of poker is like, I'm going to crush you like a bug right. and I'm going to take all of your money. And, uh, if you're a jerk to me, I'm not going to try to help you be something different than that, right? I'm, I'm going to not allow you to invade my space and I'm going to use all of your horrible qualities that are coming out here to make it so that I can win more money from you. Right. Um, and it's a, weird, it's a weird way to interact with people, right? Like you're encouraging them in some ways to be their worst self because when they're their worst self, that's actually good for what your bottom line is and what you're what your goal is in terms of what you're trying to accomplish at the table. And as I've kind of moved through my career, I think I've moved farther and farther away from that, of, of wanting that kind of interaction in my life. Yeah. Um, I wonder what it would be like if I tried, if I played poker now, I think, I, <laughs> I think I'd be like, Oh, let me help you. Be. <laughs> Let me help you you rethink that bad decision you're about to make. (laughs) Right. Are you sure you want to do that? I just, I'm just letting you know, I think that would might not be so So, good. I've really, you know, I I think we could, we can, I I have so many other questions. I have a list of, I would love to ask you, but I know we've been talking for a very long time and um, I, I really enjoyed the story. That's amazing. And I think we came full circle a little bit from where we started yeah. uh, and then uh, yeah. you know, we kind of came back again to where we uh, started. I do want to kind of just a lot, maybe last question is, uh, unless John has something, uh, something up his sleeve. Um, so, so what, what is next? Because you said, I'm still not, I'm still developing. I'm still not who I am. Still or, not quite I don't me. Know how you exactly said it, but yeah, you're still becoming. Still becoming. I'm still yeah, becoming still myself. Becoming, yes. So, so you're still becoming yourself. What, what's, what's well, I, you know, I, I mean, I just find out new things about myself all the time. You know, I mean, I, you know, my career is still like super fluid. I mean, I've got, I've got this new book coming out in the fall, which is like this very practical book as opposed to, I mean, it, it's a, How to it's, like, it's a, it's a, it's a big idea book, but it really grounds it. And like, here you go. Like here, here's how you would actually do it like it's filled with tools. It's got lots of thought experiments in it. It's like, really like, this is how you would actually execute on this. I'm really excited about that coming out in the fall. And then I don't know, like, am I going to write another book after that? You know, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I haven't really thought about it. Um, I mean, I've thought about it some, but, but enough to know, like, it would be ridiculous for me to say that I'm going to know or not know, like, let me, let me just live this moment right here. Um, When it comes to my work, Um, For a long time, I was doing like a tremendous amount of traveling, really doing a lot of speaking. And I'm finding now I'm sort of at the point in my life where um, I just don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be away from home so much. Um, I like being home. Uh, Those type of light touch interactions are certainly like, you know, you pop in and pop out, but I don't know that I find them as satisfying as the real deep Mm. dive consulting that I do. And so um, you know, I've been, I, the consulting work that I do where I really become embedded in, in the company and with the people that I'm working with, I'm finding to be the much more satisfying, you know, part of my life right now. I think a while ago, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't necessarily have had the time and space to be able to do as much of that as I do now, but now I've kind of made a lot of time and space for that because it's, I've sort of realized it's a priority. So that's, that's been incredible. And, and when I do that, it's like, I'm, I learn so much from those engagements because every, every person is unique and, and the kinds of decisions and the problems and, that they're facing are unique in the way that 
you can have the same problem, but the interaction and the culture of the the people who are sort of, you know, coming together and interacting with each other means that you have to be thinking differently about how you might solve for it or, or what suggestions you could put in place to, to, to really allow them to be them, be, their best selves and their best decision-making selves. And um, so I've, I've really, really been enjoying that. Um, and so I, th- I think I'm a little bit retreating. I'm, I'm retreating right now from the speaking some, but you know, who knows what that will look like in the future. Um, my kids are just getting to the point where they're, uh, they're all about to be gone from the house. Oh. Um, they're all back in the house right now, but, mm-hmm. um, which has been really great. So I have a little bit of respite of my, my last one is about to go off to college and, oh. um, but I get to have everybody, you know, I get to have them home. So I have my college age kids at home. And, um, so that's, you know, I'm sort of enjoying that for the moment, but I don't know what that's going to look like after my youngest goes off to college. Right. Like, so I don't know what that sort of empty nester thing looks like. And I imagine that as much as I could say to you, oh, I found my happiness and I found my joy and I sort of realized like how I can sort of be my best self and how I can interact with people in a way that I feel really good about and makes me really happy. And that this is what I'm going to continue to do that's going to bring me happiness. The one thing that I know from my life is that you have to have a lot of conviction about what you're doing in the moment, but really hold that loosely and, mm. and just sort of keep your eye out for like, what's kind of exciting you next. And I try not to allow my identity to get too wrapped up in what I'm doing, because I don't want to miss out when there's something else that might really, you know, excite me and, and make me passionate about it. And, and particularly allow me to learn just like a whole bunch of new stuff and a whole bunch of new stuff about me. And so like one of the things I've been thinking about is, um, you know, maybe starting to teach again. Um, I live close enough to UPenn that I can go back to my alma mater and maybe start to teach there. Um, I did love, I've always loved teaching. Jo- John has been at some of my poker seminars where I, where I teach poker. Um, and obviously I used to teach cognitive science and I've thought about maybe going back and teaching a class in decision processes and decision science, but I don't, you know, we'll see, we'll see how that develops. I was kind of talking about that a little bit last year. I don't know. Um, you know, do I want to actually button up my PhD? I I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, and then there's also, you know, part of me that says, uh, maybe I just like want to play tennis, you know, <laughs> which I do a lot of, which I really love. And maybe I'm ready. I've been working since I was 14, you know, may, maybe I'm ready to just kind of like hang back and play some tennis and then maybe another book ideal will come to me or maybe it won't or, you know, but I, I, so, so I just, I'm, I'm just sort of at a place where I'm like, I'm really happy with what I'm doing now. And I'm really excited about what I'm doing now. And what I recognize is that's now. And so I don't know who I will become. Right. Yeah. That's a great way to be. Absolutely. Uh, so on that note, let's wrap up. Annie, thank you so much for joining us today. You really, uh, you leave every situation better than you find it. And you've okay. definitely cast a light on us here today. Um, I don't know who you're going to become, but I'll be excited to see who that person is. And I'm sure she will continue to shine light on the world. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.